welcome back. Thank you for joining us for our second panel of the day, Strengthening Communities Through Partnership. Again, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we'll be using the Whova Q&A available to the right or the bottom of your video screen. At this time, I'm pleased to share a brief video from the session's sponsor, the Association of BC Forest Professionals. We love trees here in British Columbia. We love how they look, how they give a shade, how they absorb carbon emissions, and give animals a home to live in. Even my house is made of wood. Pretty cool, right? But how can we take care of trees and use them well? <laughs> it's simple, we trust the pros. Foresters from the Association of BC Forest Professionals don't just look after our forests and parks. They find ways to protect and restore ecosystems, protect wildlife habitat, and keep our communities safe from wildfires. They studied forestry at university or college, so they know what they're doing. They make sure the forest supports traditional, aboriginal uses, recreation, and tourism. Oh, and they also decide when, where, and how some trees can be cut, where other trees should be planted, and which should be left to grow freely. Now that's a perfect balance. The ABCFP is the largest professional forestry association in Canada. It ensures forest professionals are qualified, competent, and live up to a code of ethics. They love what they do and realize it's bigger than you and me. It's about us, our present, and our future. With the Association of BC Forest Professionals, our forests are in the best hands. Thank you to the Association of BC Forest Professionals for your support of this panel and for sharing the video. It is now my pleasure to introduce this morning's session moderator, Dallas Smith, President of the Namakolas Council. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, ABC FPGH. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. We really appreciate the sponsorships from the Association of BC Forest Professionals. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Della Smith. I'm the president of Noma Coles Council, and I'm really honored to moderate this panel remotely from the traditional territories of the Snanemu people in Nanaimo, thanks to an unscheduled fog delay for Helijet. Um, usually I do this in studio, so I appreciate a little patience from my panel as I actually do my own notes and I'm not coddled by the studio staff this year. Um, we're looking forward to a great panel on strengthening communities through partnership. We have Councillor Carl Archie from the Canham Lake First Nation. We have my good friend Chief Charlene Gale from the Fort Nelson First Nation. We have Doug Mosier, CEO of Atlee Chip Limited um, Partnership. And we have Chief Justin Napoleon from the Saltow, someone from the Saltow First Nation. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So you know, it's always seems to be a bit of a catchword, the partnerships, UNDRIP, all these things that have been coming together that talk about how First Nations need to be involved. Um, you know, Chief Gale, you and I have done about a dozen of these things, it seems, together now. And we've talked everywhere from equity partnerships to just where it all begins kind of through the gamut. And so it's really interesting to be able to reconnect with you and also talk with some of the panelists who I haven't worked before before on what people look for in these kind of partnerships. What are we looking for when we start to engage with different industries and opportunities? What are some flags that we look for? What are some things that bring us comfort? I think if we can have a real direct dialogue, it'll be really beneficial to our listeners um, to understand the difference between First Nations relationship managers who are there to manage the best interests of the company that they work for, or whether that person's actually brought in to help develop a solid relationship through partnerships and things like that. So really look forward to having some in insight from you all, and maybe we'll get right into it because I know we're going to be buttoned right up against time with all that you guys have to share. So Councillor Councillor Archie, Canham Lake First Nation, why don't you start off with some some opening comments? Uh, wait, hold up, Carl Archie and Squawks. That going to be people attended Skaskanui. My name is Carl Archie. I'm a counselor here at the Cannon Lake Band, which is located in the interior of British Columbia near a 100 mile house. Or uh, the Cannon Lake Band has been working for a number of years on on several partnerships with industry in our territory. Uh, we have three industries that are the main drivers of our economy. So that's forestry. Uh, natural gas, and then mineral exploration. Um, 
So we, we enter into these partnerships to uphold our sacred responsibility to take care of the guests in our territory that includes our, our own membership, but also the companies and the people that live and play here. So um, one of the proudest achievements that we're about to, to come across is our, is our forestry initiative we call our key interest area, which is to make sure that the Canon Lake Band is um, going to achieve an area-based tenure to protect our water, um and make sure that we have a last fortress and demonstrate respect with with the forestry industry around the Canham Lake band which so it's going to be an area-based tenure of approximately 80,000 cubic meters per year um so we've got a number of initiatives with forestry we've been working with the government on modernizing forestry policy legislative changes bill 23 28 we also have mineral exploration companies that we've been working with, so about four or five of them. Um, we've been seeing a lot of innovation coming out of the mineral exploration industry, which is quite positive and, and exciting. And then we've got oil and gas. So our company called Sys Pipelines has been working with Trans Mountain as well as Enbridge on, on those pipelines. Uh, we've also been working with other First Nations, the Simp First Nation. So we have an agreement with them called Wispetchinkt. Uh, which means our bond, uh, it also speaks to hemp rope, which is the nat strongest natural fiber known to human beings and what people use a lot historically. All this is on the backdrop of revitalizing our language, our culture, and reclaiming our identity as Squamook people. A couple of foundations that we build our partnerships on with both our, our Squamook communities, uh, other communities, and industry our Nakwachin to speak with one voice wherever possible with whoever we're talking with. We want to make sure that we come to agreement on everything um, of matter. Number two is Khadakso Sukhwatmuk, or to put Sukhwatmuk people first, our own communities first, uh, something that hasn't been done since colonization. And then the last one is Kwanamkin 12, which is just to find a shared path and the way that we refer to reconciliation in our community because. It's, it, it's about coming together and, and uncovering a new path, not either non-Indigenous people's path or Swellman people's path, but everybody's path that we had to go on together. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's exciting to see how nations are working together with each other, with industry, with government, and we're really trying to get back and control the steering wheel. I really appreciate your comments. Um, Mr. Mosier. Good to see you again, my friend. Um, you know, we've been bumping into each other through these forestry discussions for a lot longer than I want to admit my age is. Um, I know you've spent some time with industry. You spent some time on kind of both sides of the fence. You got some opening comments you want to bring towards the partnership discussion? Sure. Um, first off, thanks for letting, letting me uh, participate in this panel. And um, I'm speaking from the Semiamu First Nation, which is just... Uh, around White Rock in British Columbia. Uh, just from a, a business perspective, um, I oversee the, uh, or work with the Namgis First Nations to oversee the, the harvesting on the land-based forestry for uh, the, the um, about 45,000 cubic meters of harvest. Then we have another 91,000 cubic meters that is, has been uh, set up to, to come our, our way, as well as a, a woodlot, woodlot license. Um, recently, uh, Atlee Resources Limited Partnership, in conjunction with uh, two other partners, being Wakash uh, Timber Harvesting and Paper Excellence, we purchased a chip plant in uh, Beaver Cove, uh, which is just up by Port McNeil. Um, that week that came into play on, on April 1st. And I guess if you want to talk, um, uh, partnerships and communities and, and relationships with that many partners and that many different, different groups and a resource and the person we were buying the resource from, and, uh, basically we take the chips or the, uh, the waste wood from out, out in the forest and we chip it and sell it to, uh, to paper excellence. So that's what we've been working on late, lately, but from the aspects of, of the partnerships, I'm just going to have a, a quick say is basically I'll go to the, 
go to the end of what I'm thinking. <laughs> so to have these, these partnerships, the relationships in whatever we're moving into, you have to create, have the relationship and create the trust. Um, a lot of communications, and especially when you've got two or three partners, a lot of communications, um, perseverance is, uh, is essential and, and, and patience. And then you have to repeat it because it's not going to just happen in a day or a month. And sometimes it depends on the size of the project, not even in a, in a, in a year. So in, in, in general with that, take time to understand what the band needs or what the economic development court wants you to get involved with. Quite often the economic development court is closer to the chief and council and, and uh, what they're looking for. Take time to understand what it is that is that they, uh, that's desired. And it's going to take time. So seek first to understand and then be understood. Cause if you go into some of these agreements, positional bargaining, you're not going to be successful, at least not very quickly. So prepare to communicate and train properly. Um, if you're getting into the, into the commercial agreements, you have to go through them many, many, many times because every word, it means something different to different people and different, different, uh, bands for that matter. Depends on what lens you're looking through. And with some of these projects, um, various, you know, the bands might be looking for, um, you know, economic prosperity. They might be looking into total preservation of the area that, that they're, that they're, uh, is their territory. So what is it that they, they desire? So everybody needs to understand the wording. And, uh, I'll, I'll just like, if you want to be partners, I'll come back to it. You have to build the relationships and trust, communicate extensively, persevere. Sometimes that can be complicated, difficult, then be patient and then repeat it time and time again. And that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Doug. Um, you know, some really great points around just the perseverance and patience that it takes. You know, you can't just kind of mesh these things together and they're instantly integrated. It's important to have those lines of communication open through the ECDEV, the ECDEV sides of the community's chief and council. And so you have to be there very thorough while still being respectful. So that's where that patience comes in. Really appreciate some of those points. Chief Napoleon. Great to see you this morning. Love the shirt, man. Love the shirt. <laughs> um, got some thoughts on partnerships, you know, from an Avenger. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, the Flash wasn't an Avenger, was he? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. No, he's on the Justice League. That's right. Um, yeah, no, partnership. Uh, well, anyways, I'm Justin Napoleon. I'm from Soto First Nations. I'm the current chief. And Soto's... Um, based up north, northern BC, part of Treaty 8 territory. Um, and our whole economic life around here is um, natural resource extraction. Um, we've got two big mills in town, um, surrounded by the coal mines um, and lots of natural gas extraction. Um, that's my uh, professional history is working in the natural gas resource sector. Um, and I like the word partnership because that's growing up. I always heard joint ventures or uh, other avenues of working with the indigenous that didn't really bring long lasting benefit to the nation. So um, since I've been elected, partnership has been key. Um, and it, I, I view it through a lens of multiple facets, the, the willingness to look uh, at things in a different way, a way of looking at them through the indigenous lens a little bit and uh, looking at what's going to happen after the project is done and what's going to happen 20 years from now and how is this going to benefit the entire area um, so soto itself is involved in um, not just the harvesting of natural resources but also the um, reclamation so we're always looking to um, 
partner with people and we look at you know how, how are they willing to um, be involved with the community do they reach out do they make efforts um, are they willing to hear us out when it comes to um, different ways of looking at environmental protection or um, flexibility in the locations of certain things uh, i think a big part of the partnership is flexibility willing to be flexible in your planning and executional projects and willing to view it through the lens of the indigenous people in the area so with that being said um, i think partnerships going forward is is super important to um, just the long-term benefit of of the entire area of the first nations people of the local communities um, we all live in the same area we all got a benefit we all want economic growth and um, for our communities to prosper and i think for that to happen you need good healthy partnerships that are flexible and willing to uh, look at things from different angles not just the peer um, profitability and maximizing the uh, resource you can take out it's it's balancing it with the environmental aspects as well as the cultural aspects. Well, that, that's tremendous. Um, you know, I think that's a great point that I would like to pick up on after around partnerships or something that's new that, that are being developed, but how do we deal with some of these existing relationships and JVs? So I think you brought up a real a lot of good points that, that we can talk about during, during the not, not the debate part, but the, the discussion format. So really appreciate the insight. Um, Chief Gale, hello there. How are you? Oh, sorry. I lost you guys there. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I lost uh, connection there. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to join you today. My name is Charlene Gale. I am the Chief of the Fort Nelson First Nation in Treaty 8. And I also have the privilege of serving as the Chair of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. So I just want to take a few minutes to reflect on the importance of collaboration and partnerships as we move forward in this dialogue. Um, my passion really lies in how we create meaningful economic and business opportunities for our communities while protecting our lands and honoring our future generations. I recognize that this can't happen without strong partnerships in place with industry, government and corporate Canada. Recovering from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is very important. As you know, we are in the midst of the worst health crisis in the last um, hundred years that I've ever you know, witnessed. Um, the impacts of COVID-19 have been especially hard on all of our communities. And I personally witnessed this um, widespread social and economic damage this pandemic has caused to our indigenous communities. Um, as we seek to rebuild our economies and our societies, we must seize on the opportunities in front of us by working together as real partners with a shared vision to sustainable, innovative, and an inclusive future. Um, rebuilding the um, economy collaboratively as partners is very important to the Fort Nelson First Nation and to the First Nation Major Projects members. We must use our collective imaginations to move forward on reconciliation in a new and innovative ways. And for an example, um, we must look at beyond the legal minimums and outdated consultation models that were currently, you know, have been a time of the past. The, the simple consultation um, of our nations for our input on major resources and energy projects has come to an end. And we must use our creativity and diligence to establish new equity models benefiting Indigenous communities to support meaningful partnerships on projects. This will help to rebuild our economies as partners. You know, as Chief Napoleon said, you know, we as Indigenous people aren't going anywhere and we need to find and establish new ways of jointly managing our lands and our resources together. And I believe this is central to um, achieving all of our collective potential in BC and to pr improving all lives of British Columbians and the Indigenous peoples that live um, around you. Um, finding new ways to work collaboratively um, to manage our lands and resources is also a fundamental way 
to the transition towards a net zero future. And, you know, that's a big conversation that's happening right now, getting to a net zero future. And one of the challenges we have as Indigenous communities is access to capital. So navigating a just transaction will require all of us to ensure that Indigenous rights are being protected and safeguarded while we work to protect Mother Earth. And of course, we will need our natural resources to address the climate change. You know, uh, uh, Regional Chief Terry TG talked about, you know, climate change and, and our responsibility. Um, to that. And as you appreciate, the responsible development of our natural resources is the backbone of the BC economy. And indeed, BC is good at uh, responsible development. We use some of the most um, best technologies and practices, some of the most um, robust and strict environmental regulations. And, you know, there has been many examples of solid partnerships between First Nations, um, government and industries. And in my opinion, um, net zero is a huge opportunity not only to address climate change, but to ensure Indigenous rights and benefits are finally at the forefront of new developments. I know Chief Napoleon and his community are working on a renewable project. You know, we have our geothermal project and we're seeing um, what, what this can look like through Indigenous leadership. And we're already seeing what... Um, you know, across BC and across the country, um, there's a lot of LNG, there's geothermal, there's wind, there's battery storage. And I see Indigenous communities at the forefront of leading this transition to net zero. I think it's very important. Um, obviously, we're thinking about our future and, and future generations and how we can address this issue. And one of the ongoing key challenges that all of us face is our ability to access competitively priced capital to finance these clean energy and net zero projects. Our nations have historically had barriers to participating in the resources development due to this lack of capital. And for many generations, we have been stripped of our wealth, you know, um, and it makes it hard for us now to provide the equity we need to be involved as partners and to reduce the risk and therefore the cost of borrowing and ensuring that Indigenous people have the opportunity to secure competitively priced capital is key to empowering Indigenous leadership in the transition towards this net zero. And we cannot and we will not be left behind. Indigenous people are ready and willing to be partners in the clean energy projects. Industry, you know, what I've seen, they, they want to work with us. There is a demand for products and materials in our territories. And the most biggest challenge is the bottleneck to access to capital. So it is my belief and it's my position at the First Nation Major Projects Coalition that we do need a BC Green Energy Indigenous Loan Guarantee Program if we want to be successful. Um, there are already models out there that BC can look to for inspiration. And this includes the Ontario in, uh, Loan Guarantee Program um, and the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. You know, with the looming climate emergency and all the challenges we have just seen um, in the last bit in BC, we cannot get this wrong. We need to work together as true partners towards a shared vision for a low carbon future. And I really believe the lives of uh, the future generation depend on all of us by coming together. We can no longer work in silos. Um, you know, with that, I just look forward to this panel and, and this discussion today. And before I end my remarks, I just wanted to invite everybody to the First Nation Major Projects Coalition Net Zero Conference happening April 25th and 26th. And there we'll really be able to dig into the opportunities and the barriers and some concrete ways that we continue to move forward as partners. So with that, Masi, hi, hi, and thank you. Thank you very much. You know, just the tremendous amount of insight that comes from different parts of the province is so important to moving the overall dialogue around some of the barriers that you just addressed, Chief Gale. Um, I really want to applaud you and your network and colleagues at FNMPC. Hey, I got that one right for once at FNMPC for doing that work around helping to build that process for low end guarantees and making sure that we're having those discussions that, you know, it's not consultative anymore. Like you said, it's equity or nothing. And how do we do this? And it would be interesting to see if the First Nations Leadership Council started talking to the province about a share of the climate tax. Um, 
for for helping us get to net zero on some of these projects. We've seen them go there on gaming revenue where they've started to share that. Maybe the climate tax is going to be a little better spent by us, but maybe that's for next panel. Um, I, I encourage everybody watching the app to send your questions in. I'm multitasking between my phone and my iPad here, but while some questions are coming in, um, maybe I'll ask Councillor Archie, um, what is it that you're looking for in a new partner? And, you know, we talked during our prep call, you have some time in the banking industry, but you're also very culturally grounded. You're, you're, you're a speaker of your language. What are some of the things you're looking for when you sit down with a new perspective industry looking for a partnership with your community? Yeah, thank you, Dallas. So I have, um, as, as Dallas had just mentioned, some experience working as a commercial banker, it was my first job out of university. So a couple of things that came from that experience are two principles that kind of ground what we do. And so the first is uh, do the right thing always. And then the second is no surprises. And then uh, regarding the other aspects of what we do, we try to sit down and establish a number of principles upon which we're going to operate or establish a partnership agreement um, with the people that we're speaking to. And so do the right thing is uh, making sure that uh, people who are advising our community are advising us in the right way, making sure that we're always doing our due diligence, making informed decisions, and that we follow a proper process so that we're accountable and transparent to our community members and everything that we do. Um, because I can tell you, we've been steered wrong a number of times in the past, and it doesn't feel good to realize that uh, we've, we've steered ourselves wrong, we've steered our community members wrong, and the people who live in our territory. Um, no surprises is uh, an approach to communications and negotiation that we that we use in working with other uh, with proponents. And so it forms the foundation of most of our agreements. It just means that, that we're taking a proactive approach to communications that uh, companies, proponents, governments are always making sure that they keep us apprised of every development that's coming up. Um, so that we have the chance to say yes or to say no at any point in the stage. Um, and that when we get to a point of achieving free prior and informed consent that we've already said yes a thousand times before we get to a final agreement. We took this approach with um, the Columbia River Treaty negotiations and we found that we were able to actually change the world with this approach and it led to the first constructive arrangement to Canada that contained approval from governments of British Columbia and Canada for the words free, prior, and informed consent. Um, the next are the three principles that we use in our community, as I had mentioned before, uh, and so we, we establish those principles to make sure that um, proponents come to our community and, just, and know that we're going to put of people and our needs and our wants first in our community and our territory because for 150 years of colonization our needs have been put last and and once again it's not a good feeling uh when i'm to 12 uh, making sure that we have hard hard discussions to make sure that there's a shared understanding of what we're trying to achieve uh both in our territory and um and business-wise to make sure that there's going to be money for everybody Thank you. Thank you. That's some, some great answers, um, which leads it's a great segue into the next question for Chief Napoleon. Um, you know, we all talked about partnerships, new partnerships. We want people to come talk to us for your community or just from your personal perspective. How do you recommend prospective partners come to you? Do you want them to come to chief and council first? Do you want them going to someone in the ECDEV? corporation for some some nations that's all the same person so it's an interesting capacity discussion but just from your own personal take where, where would you like to see people knocking first thanks Dallas good question um, for the way we handle it at Soto is we kind of have a, a front man that is our initial contact for um, any prospective economic um, activity with Soto whether it be partnerships or potential projects or uh, just companies looking to partner with us. Um, and he always kind of vets them and will then line up a more official meeting with chief and council to um, 
get down to the values and the, the potential partnerships that we might find with whatever aspect of um, industries reaching out at the moment. So with Soto, we kind of look for five different ways of how we rate people and, and the partnerships that we have. And uh, it's community-based, how, how well and how involved are they in the community? Um, do they attend our, our events? Do they try to learn the culture? Um, and then there's the environmental aspect. How well do they work with our trip department? Um, are they willing to um, help fund our own independent um, surveys and um, environmental impact assessment and studies? Um, and then uh, economic opportunities, how well and how open are they to involving the First Nations in their um, uh, project and how how involved are they? Um, and then innovation at the last one, which I like to kind of put it to a point of, you know, are they willing to look at an equity model? Are they willing to uh, look at a specialized training model for our members? Are they willing to um, bring on subcontractors that are business owners from our nation to help them grow? Um, so that's, I think that one covers most of it. That's, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to come in there. There's lots of things that have to be part of our sniff tests. And it's nice when you have kind of a, a champion out there who can put the filter in case, because I know a lot of fly by nights are still kicking around trying to have a really flashy looking proposal, but they're just kind of dancing it around as opposed to engaging in a conversation about what a partnership looks like, what the actual proposal is, how is it going to benefit the community, all those sorts of things. So, um, for all you fly-by-nighters out there, your days are done. Um, th th this is tremendous. We, we yep. could do this all day. Um, but another great question coming in. I'll, I'll give this to you, to Chief Gale. Um, maybe I'll actually put the two questions together at once. What are some examples of some gold standard partnerships that you've seen in BC and possibly maybe throughout Canada if need be? And then I'll also add the component of how do you balance proposed partnerships that may be economic gain but not helpful to climate change? Well, actually, that's a, that's a tough one to two-part it. Sorry, I didn't read the full question. How about you go with some of the gold-plated standard ones? My bad. Studio guys should have helped me on that one. <laughs> so I, I think, uh, first off, as Indigenous people, we're rightfully taking our place in the economic mainstream in, of this country and, and in our communities. And I think that, um, you know, communication and the approach of industry is, is definitely evolved over time. Um, there's still people that don't get the concept of incorporating I, Indigenous, into their ESG and their corporate values. I think that's very important. Um, getting into... Uh, some of the projects that I've been working on um, personally in my territory, you know, I've seen many come and go. Like you said, Dallas, those days are over. Um, you know, in, in Fort Nelson, you know, when we look at a project, it's very important that the project is um, brought forward to the board of directors so that we can take an extensive look at what this means. And, um, you know, we have really formed a group of uh, individuals that have expertise in, in many different, um, you know, professional professions. And through the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, it really helps us take a really great look at what the project is. So when a proponent comes in my territory, one of the things that I really appreciated is, you know, we're being very truthful and bringing our um, challenges to the table. We want equity in this project. I'm not going to put my community at risk and I need access to capital. And these are my challenges. And these are some of the things that I need to do to get there. And I need your support. I need industry support. Um, and I also need government support. So, um, you know, I've seen, um, you know, a lot of uh, offers of, of equity, but not being solution based on how the nation can be a part of that meaningfully, especially if the project is going to be in our territory for over 30 years. So my advice is that um, sometimes it's best to work with the First Nation, have, um, you know, agreement and an MOU in place and an understanding that, 
you know, this project could be this pro these projects, major projects could be built by investors. And, you know, with the, the support of the First Nation and an understanding that, you know, when the project is built, um, you know, the, the First Nation doesn't have to put any money up front, that you're going to work with them and uh, allow that opportunity for e equity when the project has been deemed viable and is up and running. Um, but while you're doing that and building the facility, you're also working with our community to ensure that our people are ready, that the training is in place and the things that are happening in the construction of this project are going to um, be meaningful to, to our nation and to our members through employment. Um, you know, I, I think about, um, you know, the opportunity for us to get into a pellet plant in the Fort Nelson area. We were successful by coming together with the local municipality and creating a partnership on the largest community forest in the province. And I think um, with that comes a huge responsibility because not only as a nation, we have to look at our responsibility to the land and um, our members always make decisions on the land. So when you have a partner that comes in and respects your values and also comes in and says, we're not gonna do this project unless we have your blessing. That's what I find of value. That's what I find in a good partner. And um, I could see that uh, relationship fostering over time, irregardless of your um, change out in, in council or your board of directors of your, of your Daytai Corporation. Um, maybe getting into like kind of the, the second question that you were talking about is council plays a very important role in our ability to, to separate the politics from the business. You know, those are two different functions. Our leadership established a board of directors to oversee our economic arm of Daytai limited partnership. And it's really important to maximize the separation between the politics and the businesses because we minimize our liability to the nation. And, you know, the council still has ownership of the business, but they leave the running of the business up to the board of directors and the corp, the CEO of the corporation. So, you know, we continue to update the council on a quarterly basis and arrange special meetings when necessary, especially with our partners that are, that are coming in on some of the big opportunities that are happening in Fort Nelson. Um, you know, we've had a downturn in our economy over time, and it really gave us a really great opportunity to get caught up on what we want to do. Um, our nation put a five-year strategic plan in place, and we have a comprehensive community plan that we're working towards to be complete by 2025. So these kind of things are really important that, you know, we're involved in any major project that happens in our territory in a meaningful way. And I think it's important for industry to um, respect the wishes of the Indigenous communities where you're planning to operate. No means no. And at times there's um, things that uh, we can work around so that we all can be successful. Oh, tremendous. I, I really appreciate you bailing me out and answering both questions, even though they're they're kind of not loaded, but they weren't weren't quite harmonizing like they did when I was reading them. I tried. <laughs> um, appreciate nice, nice. That's why you're my go to. Um, what was the next one? Sorry. In terms of uh, for Doug, Doug Mosier, you know, you're you're involved in in a relatively new partnership. You've been involved in many others throughout your career. Um, in terms of partnerships, how important is equity, and how does equity investment from First Nations look? I know you have a different equity scheme with with your couple partners. Maybe you can just throw some insight on on how you and Numgees work to to build what works for Numgees in in this relationship. Sure. Okay, we've got, with, with Numgees, of course, is a chief and council, and there's also the economic um, development court. And then, then there's the different projects that we, that we can be involved in. So um, the, the Atlee Resources, the group that I work with, the board of directors has got tremendous experience. Um, uh, one of the fellows, the treasurer, he's, he spent extensive time um, working with one of the major, um, um, like KPMG, uh, finding funding, working through various projects. So we kind of work when we find a new, a new project, 
we all work together. Okay, is this going to work? What do we think? Um, where can we find the funding, get the equity fr from? At the same time, always being con conscious of protecting the uh, the band from, let's say, adverse effects. If if uh, if one if if there's funding can't be found, but what if something goes wrong? So we're very, very heavy on uh, on the due diligence processes. We have found various sources, very cooperative sources, to uh, provide funding for the uh, various project uh, um, searching out through the due diligence, and at the same time constantly talking to the Economic Development Corp. and the, in this case the Natural Resource Group of the Nungis First Nation. And then uh, we have had some sessions where the, let's say the uh, forestry counselor would join us in uh, maybe some brainstorming exercises or here's what's coming down, down the pipe, basically trying to keep communications open, talking to Chief Don as, as, as much as we can or as appropriate. So then once we start, we believe that we can uh, advance a project and the Numgays have a number of different projects. Um, then we go after, okay, what funding can we get? What, what partners can we uh, entice to come on to our projects? And I'd say with the chip plant, we ended up with, uh, with the Atlee, in Atlee Chip Limited Partnership, Atlee Resources with 60% ownership. So there's the Numgays, the primary ownership, uh, another company's at 25%, another one's at 15. And uh, through that whole process, um, don't put the don't put the community at risk. And that's our goal. And we've got another couple in the background, we've just started doing, uh, I'll call it the background due diligence and uh, searching for it for the funding to do the preliminary preliminary steps before advancing to the, the real purchase. Oh, great stuff, Doug. Thanks. It's nice to see that we're actually talking about equity. You know, Chief Gale and I talk about this from time to time over the last couple of years about we started with just allowing partnerships being a consent-based thing and then actually being a meaningful part of them. Um, Councillor Councillor Archie Carl, um, I've actually gotten a question and a text message, so I'm pumping one of these questions up the line. One of our audience members would really love to hear your answer about the point of contact discussion. We alluded to the fact that each community has different capacities and different avenues for contact, but um, one of our one of our listeners is excited enough that they texted me to ask you that question specifically as well. So your first your first um, call out. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Dallas. Uh, we have uh, recently reorganized our company. So we have an economic development corporation and a CEO. So obviously, well, I guess not obviously, but um, so so the new point of contact would be the chief executive officer. We also have a number of companies. So we've got about five different companies and each of those managers is also responsible for running their own company, so it'd be appropriate to, to reach out to them. Um, I've also had a number of people reach out directly to me. And so oftentimes what I do in that case is forward those contacts to our CEO. In any case, uh, we work closely as the council responsible for economic development um, with our companies and our board of directors anyway. So we work on a no surprises approach as well. And we were in regular contact. Um, so that's how our community works. I understand it probably works for other communities um, a bit differently. I also see that there was another question about how to you ensure that your that your um, company is ready for for partnerships. And we have a couple of things that we we work on with the companies that we work with. And the first one is that you want to support Indigenous rights. And so I'll give you an example. We propose a clause in two different agreements for um, two different companies and. Uh, they're quite similar, but the clause was exactly the same. And it said the company supports Indigenous rights, Section 35 Aboriginal rights, Sequentmuk rights, or any other international or constructive arrangement right that may be found. And one company accepted, and the other company said, actually, we acknowledge the existence of 
average rights in clause eight. So we don't want to accept uh, this particular clause. And so you can guess which company is going to gain the support of the county band and which one is not. Uh, it's quite it's quite simple, really. It's like going to a person and saying, I acknowledge your existence, but I don't support you. So it's quite quite a slap in the face there. But also, um, we we are we're just getting tired of corporate welfare. Um, things like companies who are not willing to pay over and above um, the, le the minimum legal requirements, as Chief Charlene had mentioned before. Uh, companies come to us and talk to us about low cost resources. Uh, we're no longer interested in working with companies who um, say that the only way that they're going to participate in the market is if they have low cost resources because the cost comes at the expense of First Nations, our people and our companies and our band and the, and the support of our rights. So we're no longer willing to subsidize companies. If you can't pay a fair market price for the resources that are in our territory, then you're not the partner for us. We've also been proposing um, economic sanctions in our agreements. And so that means um, either reduced access to our territories, withdrawal of support for permits or the cease of operations on a temporary or permanent basis in, in our territory. And so companies that don't agree to that are not welcome to, to work in our territory because as Indigenous governments, we are the government and we have our own set of laws. Um, Certainty is only achieved through holding and maintaining consent of the Indigenous nations. So um, with that, thanks, Dallas. Thank you, Carl. Um, really appreciate the answers everybody's giving. I think there's a lot of good stuff that people are going to be able to take and generate the dialogue, which is sort of why BCNRF was there. And for those of you looking for more exclusive Indigenous content, I'll give a shameless plug for the BC Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference that I help host. Um, that'll be coming later in the spring. Um, Chief Napoleon, you know, it, it's interesting. I'm looking at this at looking at this panel and seeing that the age of First Nations leadership seems to be getting younger and younger. I'm 45 years old, 46 years old. I've been doing this for, you know, 22, 23 years. And in those days, I was the youngest person in the room by 30 years easily. What is something that your community is doing to try, you know, now I'm the old guy, old guy on the panel. Well, thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. <laughs> Um, now I'm the old guy on the panel, but what do you do to try and encourage, you know, the youth as the future leaders? How do you include them in discussions around these issues? And, you know, is it just a community discussion or do you try to reach out to youth or elders differently? What, what are some of your thoughts on youth getting involved in, in, you know, these discussions and taking their place in the world? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, it's been a little hard getting anybody to do anything lately with, with COVID. So um, everything's kind of had to be handled electronically. Um, we haven't really had too many in-person meetings, I guess, um, at our nation since the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, but we are looking at one starting to form a youth council that is the, the youth voice for the nation. Um, to provide input on serious um, subjects and serious things that are coming up for the nation. Um, and then social media, I'm not super, super active, but I am friends with lots of the youth from the nation on, on some of the social media platforms. So um, easily accessible through those. Um, and I think that's kind of probably the easiest way to get in touch with the youth nowadays is to be involved in social media as much as some people might not agree or like it. It is one great form of communication. Um, and surprisingly, I'm not even the youngest chief uh, Soto's had. There was um, not last term's chief, but the term before that was significantly younger. He was, uh, I think he was probably the youngest chief in BC or Canada's history. He was, he was really young. So I think Soto itself has a pretty open mindset with the way the world's changing and finding the balance with youth and also having elders to make sure that we're keeping up with the world, but not forgetting where we came from. Mm -hmm. mm, tremendous. Well said, well said. Um, you know, I, I want to save some time for some parting comments, but I got one more, one more question for Chief Gale. Um, and you alluded to this a little bit in, in your other, in some of your other answers and, um, 
How do you balance proposed partnerships that may have some great economic gain and potential, but not necessarily helpful to climate change? And that is a bit of a loaded question. We see Ferry Creek, we see some of the issues around LNG, um, pipelines, all those things. And we all know that there's a balance that needs to be needs to be achieved and fought for. But what are some of your thoughts about how you weigh those issues within your community? Okay, so um, like I said earlier that our decisions are made on the land, so we really look at projects in a very complex way. Um, you know, we engage with our members and our youth about a proposal that is coming to us that we're very interested in, that we think could bring benefit to our future generations um, for the lifetime of the project. Um, one of the things that I that I find um, very difficult when we're involved in these high level projects, and I know a lot of communities are, is is um, navigating things like financing through the capital markets and um, find it extremely challenging um, because we don't always require those specialized skills and expertise. So um, even when a project is coming to us, we, we need a broad range of expertise and technical support from lawyers and advisors, investors, um, our CEO, um, consultants and accountants, just to fathom what this opportunity could possibly be. Um, we work with our lands office and our guardians and our members to talk about what the impacts um, would be on the land and the challenges that we may um, we may uh, face as we get into to a project that may um, not align with our values. Um, so those are things that we take in consideration. Those are things that we look, um, you know, when we talk about bringing expertise into our communities, we, we have to really rely on that external help to help make an informed business decision. And we are also investing in our youth because there are leaders of tomorrow. And, you know, a lot of our youth are going into um, universities and becoming um, professionals that we want them to come back to our community so that, you know, we have this expertise within our own nations as we grow into the future. So I, I just have to say that, you know, any project that we get involved in as a nation in any direction that um, is given, we, we take seriously. Um, we're very accountable to our members and everything we do is very transparent. Um, you know, there's no secrets to what we're doing because we're getting the direction from the community. They're mandating us to explore more and then just bringing that information back to to our members, you know, to get their blessing that, you know, they think that this project would be beneficial. Um, they would like to explore it, um, you know, more. And one of the things that I like about um, some of the people that we're currently working for right now are working with right now on equity positions is at any time that, you know, the community is not comfortable, then, you know, it's it's a stop, you know, and, and it, it could be a conversation about can we get over these challenges? Is there a way that we can instill best practices so that, you know, we can we can uh, access these resources in a way that is going to allow space for future generations to still have places to go? And those are all things that we just keep in consideration. But I think for um, any nation, um, the one thing that is really important is have a really solid land use plan so that your community is already deciding before you get involved in in uh, economics and major projects is where and where you can't go. Um, that is a real game changer. So I think that is a, a huge step in being able to um, make decisions in a way that, um, you know, the business community is is uh, so used to, right? And the other thing too, I think um, is useful for other um, nations and, and people listening is just be patient with us. You know, these things are new for us. Uh, we don't always have all the answers and sometimes it takes a little bit more for us to make decisions. And, um, you know, just being involved with our geothermal project, you know, that project in turnkey is supposed to be is supposed to be in 2025. So, you know, you gotta take in consideration that these projects take time, they're not built overnight. And there's a lot of things that you have to do to get up to to turn that key. So just with that, um, I hope that answers your question. Oh, great stuff. Great stuff. Land use planning is so important for a community to have its own vision. 
Um, so great, great comment there. I've got about 45 seconds left for the, each of each of you, um, just for a final thought that you really want to leave our audience with. And I really want to appreciate everybody for tuning in today. So Doug, um, parting shot, parting thoughts. Sure. I think it's, it's, uh, put out what I put out right at the beginning there. Um, in these, in the relationships, you want projects to go forward, uh, you got to create the relationships and trust, and that's going to take time. A uh, lot of communications, and the communications can change depending on the skill sets of the people that you're, you're working with. Perseverance, and as uh, Chief Charlene mentioned, uh, patience. If you don't have the patience, things can go, can go awry, and then you repeat that. Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Great stuff. Um, Councillor Carl Archie, parting parting thoughts. Thank you, Dallas. Um, I, I guess a couple of things that I that come to mind as we close is to that, particularly for Indigenous nations, is to recognize the importance of your Indigenous identity because that's primarily what give what it's what drives companies to come to our table in the first place, and so. I remember even when I was graduating from university, uh, I went to an elder and I was bragging about how I was going to get my economic de economics degree. And and she she just looked at me and she said, which means don't forget that you're first. And so that really um, made a big impression on me. Uh, she told me that over a decade ago, but making sure that 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 forms the foundation of who we are and the type of, and the way that we do business in our territory because it's different and and it matters. Thank you. Great comments. It's really nice to tie that back to being prepared and having our elders in our communities have that that impact on us to make sure we keep focused on on what's important. Um, Chief Napoleon, uh, final thoughts for for the day. Sure. Um, I guess just uh, a quick look at the world today is, you know, we're, we're all seeing and feeling the effects of climate change and, and the negative impacts that it's had on, you know, this area, BC, lower Southern BC. Um, so I think going forward, um, you know, economically, we've got to look at things through a different light. Um, there's got to be a little more thought put into the long-term effects of projects and, and how can we better work for the environmental protection aspect of a project and, and what the after effects when the project's finished and gone. And I think um, Indigenous participation in that is um, extremely important. And I think by working in meaningful partnerships that uh, we can definitely change the world. Absolutely. Tremendous stuff. Tremendous stuff. I really want to thank all all four of you for being part of this dialogue today and our audience for the questions. I want to sort of tongue in cheek apologize to the Association of BC Professional Foresters. But if any of you have worked with First Nations communities, you know, we don't tease you if we don't love you. Um, so I, I leave that parting comment. And I just want to let the industry world know that you're seeing a fine showcase of where First Nations communities are at. These leaders are young, they're informed, and they're ready to build partnerships. So as long as we all keep picking up our game, we're going to be able to deal with these issues that come in front of us, whether it be climate change, whether it be policy directions and issues. If we can really sit down and have those discussions, we're going to continue to make sure that we find that sustainable balance. So I want to thank BCNRF for allowing me to moderate this tremendous session and wish everybody else a good day and good luck. Gaila Kessler, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dallas and panelists. We sincerely appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Next in the schedule, we are moving into our networking break sponsored by Enbridge from 12.15 to 1.30 p.m. We invite you to join the participating sponsors and exhibitors in their virtual networking rooms. And you can do so by visiting the community tab and from there select the virtual meetups. And don't forget to check out our exhibitors in the virtual trade show. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us this morning. We'll see you back online at 1.30 for the next keynote, which will be from Honorable Jonathan Wilkinson, Minister of Natural Resources.